Hello and welcome to Willow Talk. Adam Peacock and Brad Haddon here. Hads, man, has Test Cricket had a good couple of days? Well, it's been an extraordinary summer and it's been topped off with an absolute corker at the Gabba. Shamar Joseph, what about that spell? We thought his toe was about to fall off. He was in his bed half an hour before play <laughs> and, and all of a sudden he came out and bowled an inspired spell 12 overs straight. Hmm. To see the West Indies win a test match. Now, you were at the Gabba. I was on the couch. So I was taking in what was going on at the Gabba. I was taking on what was going on with England, India, and I was just transfixed by all of it. And it's a weird situation, and we'll get to what's coming up and, and everything in a moment, but it, it felt weird going to bed on Sunday night. I thought to myself, I'm actually not unhappy that Australia's lost a test match. And whoa, I'm actually, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Hear me out. And I'm actually, I don't feel too bad about England winning a test match. Because for the greater good of it's Test be a Cricket, very short show. <laughs> for the greater good of Test Cricket, it was a damn good day because this, again, and we know it because yep. it's in our blood, but new people to cricket might not know what Test Cricket actually means. That was the essence of it on Sunday. It was a good day for a spectator. Yes. That, that, that's what it was. To, to see Thank the you, West Bradley. Indies with the, with the side they brought out, how they were, oh, they didn't really compete in, in the mm. first Test at Adelaide. Then you quickly go to the England match. They are 190 runs behind. Stuffed. Mate, the, and the way Pope played on that surface, hmm. I, I haven't seen an, in, an innings like that before in my life. I've seen a Kevin Peterson take um, India on with, with his reach and the way he used the depth of the crease. But the way he played the reverse sweep, he was sweeping over his own head. It looked like at times that the Indian bowlers didn't have any idea what they were trying to do on a surface that suited them. Yeah, extraordinary, extraordinary couple of test matches. And later in the week, we're going to get into India, England, because the second test comes up on Friday. And we're looking forward to that because India have got a few problems. They've not only lost the test match, they've lost a couple of players and big players at that for that one. But coming up in this particular episode of Willow Talk, we're going to review in detail Australia's loss to the West Indies at the Gabba. We'll try to answer the unanswered questions coming out of the test summer and look ahead to Wednesday's Australia Cricket Awards. And we'll try and delve into who's going to win and who's going to succeed. Last week, we gave our listeners the task of getting us 250 ratings on Spotify and 80 ratings on Apple Podcasts by the end of the summer. Well, hats off to all our Spotify listeners because we've already hit 250. I'm not actually going to take my hat off because it's looking a bit kind of thin up there with the lights in here in the studio. So we've got to 250. Let's raise the bar to 300. We'll try and get there maybe by the time... The New Zealand series comes around in about a month's time. And on Apple, we're now at 72 ratings, eight more to get to 80. So if you could uh, chime in with a few, that'd be great. Mid-17 said, great insight to the players' game reviews. Four stars. A little room for improvement there. Looking for more mids. And Peter and Michelle said, yeehaw, gets me through the week. Five stars. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Michelle. And we love hearing those things. Keep the ratings and reviews coming. And if you're finally listening on the listener app, hit that favorite button. Did you get some, you get much cred when you're traveling around with the Triple M Mate, crew we, about Willow Talk? Yeah, we have. We've, we've got a lot of great feedback through the whole summer. Uh, I tell you where, Melbourne was was the one that was listening most. Uh, had a lot of feedback from the crowd. That, mm. that was all good. Um, yep. As a New South Welshman going to Victoria, you don't always get pleasant feedback. No. I got some of the Australian Open. People saying, oh yeah, I love the, the cricket podcast. So I was like, oh, cool. Taking over the world. How good. Yeah, we are. World domination. Look yeah. out. We're going to start our own, uh, no, anyway. Thanks uh, to Djokovic for that too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's get into the Australia Windies review. So Windies win by eight runs. Amazing finish. No, no way in the world had you stepping on the plane from Sydney to Brisbane. Did you think firstly, you'd be still there after the amount of days that we had? And secondly, you'd be coming back home telling the kids about witnessing a West Indies win on Australian soil. Well, I, I can tell you, everyone was looking for early flights. Yeah. That, that's exactly what was going to happen. They thought Steve Smith and the Australian batters were going to knock the total off and, and everyone would be home on an early flight. And, and it's an extraordinary win. Australia had the West Indies five down yeah. in that first session. And, and to be able to, the partnership in the middle with, with Hodge and De Silva to get them to a competitive total, then all of a sudden, what happened on the last day Joseph was outstanding. He bowled 12 overs straight. We, we know he took the knock on the toe. He got cleared of any break, but he, he, he said he was back in the hotel half an hour, 45 minutes before the play. It's an amazing story. Uh, amazing. And then, then the captain said, mate, I, I need you. And uh, he, he must've had something. He must have a needle or some good painkillers because his pace 
got quicker from the from the eighth to the twelfth over than it was for the first eight. It was an amazing spell. Mate, the the in twenty thirty two we're led to believe that the hundred meter final will be run at the Gabba. I challenge anyone in that race <laughs> to run as quick as he did after he took that final wicket. That was an amazing celebration, an amazing moment. So well called by uh, Smithy. So well called by Gus Wallen as yep. well on Triple M. Um, listen to that one as well. That was fantastic. Good work, Gussie. But yeah, the, the whole the whole feeling around it, it, it looked like for the first two days, there was a good crowd there. It was set up nicely, tight first innings, Australia declared. It looked like a, a great atmosphere at the ground. Now, the crowd dropped off towards the end, and unfortunately, it looked like a Sheffield Shield crowd at the ground, but everyone was transfixed because the viewing numbers were huge and the listening numbers around the country as well. But being there when that happened, what was like, what were you witnessing with, with West Indies legends like Brian Lara and Carl Hooper and, and Australian legends as well, who I don't know how you feel about watching an Australian test defeat, but there was a little feeling of you as like, this is actually a good thing? No, I did, definitely didn't feel like that, Adam. I can tell you I did not feel like that. But it was funny watching the day pan out. You, you lost a couple of wickets. You think, oh, okay, Green, he, he departs early. Travis said, oh, hang on, he's gone first ball. Mitch Marsh goes. Then you could see the West Indies start to believe. Hmm. At, at the start of the day, I, I think they were sort of in the same boat as everyone else, that the game would just drift on it, Australia get the total done. But... Once they started to believe that their catching was outstanding, that the pace of, of both Josephs, it, it was intimidating. And, and once they got the tail in, mm. that, that they went after the tail. That, they made life uncomfortable with sheer pace. And Jamar Joseph was an interesting one because he, he wasn't meant to bowl. Then you couldn't get the ball out of his hands. But sometimes you watch guys bowling around 145 Ks on the radar gun. You think, oh, really? Mm. This looked like it. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, this looked intimidating. He got quicker and quicker as the, the game went on. But the crowd was the interesting one and everyone in the current commentary box because, if I'm honest, you didn't really think West Indies were a chance. No, mm. no one really thought. They said, oh, maybe a draw with the weather. Then all of a sudden, momentum started to come. You had Brian Lara was doing ball by ball. He, mm. he had Cole Hooper at the end of the game was in tears. That, that, they were emotional. Yeah. Um, Ian Bishop as well. They, they flocked down... Um, to the presentation area that they were embracing. There was tears. It was a really emotional time for the West Indies cricket because no one gave this team, especially Hoggy, um, any chance of winning. Rodney Hogg, yeah, said they were uh, pathetic and hopeless. And that's what Rodney Hogg does. He yep. tells it as it is and how he thought. And it was hard to disagree with him after the first one. It was harsh language, but Captain Brathwaite said after it, it actually kind of lit a fuse underneath it. And, and that's what words... Can do. Have you ever had that before a test match where you've used some words from an outside influence to inspire you, or you oh, didn't go about it that way? There, like all no. It, that that outside influences didn't really worry me. There, mm. there was always noise outside. If you're not doing well, or you're coming off a bad series as a team, that people are paid for comment. Um, Hog, Hoggy's quite blunt um, <laughs> in, in his appraisal of, That's a, a fair of, way of putting most it. most things, but it, he, he's got a point. He, this West Indian team at that three or four debutants. Mm. Um, like even Hodge and guys like that, their, their first class records don't stand up to put in a performance like that under pressure in a test match. So it, it was an extraordinary win. It, it's it's as good as win as I, I think West Indies have ever had in test cricket. This was yeah. a young, young team. And it, it was the emotional side of it. Um, we interviewed Shamar Joseph afterwards. He was holding back tears. Yeah, He, he, he could see the genuine excitement um, in the face of the West Indies. A bit of shock. Um, also of, of what they just done. Um, and when they seen the likes of Lara, um, Carl Hooper and, and guys like that come down, it, it was just like it, the, the moment down there was, it, it was pretty emotional to, to watch for West Indies cricket. It was that, and that's what kind of took the edge off it from an Australian perspective or for many of us had, maybe not you, about the loss. And we'll get to what Australia could have done better and um, what it means for Australia in a moment. But still on the windies and this Joseph kid. So he's not that big. He's 172 centimetres. Obviously now we know about him so well. There's been some wonderful articles yep. written about him. Emma Kemp in the Herald wrote a fantastic background about him, how he grew up in rural Guyana. Now, yep. if you don't know... Guyana, it's actually part of South America. Yep. So it's, it's Clive Lloyd's from there, yep. if I'm not mistaken. And so he, he grew up basically without technology. Now you look at a guy who bowls that quick and you think his body, surely something's going to go wrong because he, he's bowling at 150 Ks an hour and he's 172 centimeters. Surely there's something going right. But you, you look at his upbringing and you think, 
well, he wouldn't have been sitting on the couch too much, <laughs> like like us in the Western world. He he would have been, you know, out and about, outdoors all day, running around, and everything like that. His build, he shouldn't be able to build uh, bowl that quick, but he does. How, Hads, in your opinion, does he bowl that quick? And how would you face him? Genes, he, he's just genetically blessed. The, yeah. the way he moves across the ground, he he he, he was powerful. He, the the way. His ex- explosive muscle muscles were just watching him chase the ball. Um, he, he's In got fa- yeah, yeah, he's got fast twitch muscles as most West Indians do. Mm. Um, but I, I want to go back to the story. Mm. Tw- Twenty four months ago, he's a security guard. <laughs> I, I tell you what, you wouldn't steal a Mars bar because he'd run you down in hundred. Seven Elevens are the safest place to be <laughs> in Guyana. <laughs> but. To, to be able to do that, he, he's got five from the first test. Mm. He got a handy 30. The crowd loved him straight away, the, the way he played and the passion he, he spoke about for the game. Then to back it up after Australia would have had a lot of review about him, said, okay, this is what he does now. Well, that's what the question yeah. you asked after the first test. You yep. said, okay, I want to see him do it again. Yep. Well, he did. <laughs> Mate, he, he did, but the, but it was the way he did it. Oh. He, he, on that last day where... He, that backs were against the wall. Everyone thought Australia was go, going to knock it over. Mate, he grabbed the ball for 12 over spell. You, you talk about rotation. You mm. talk about um, all the um, sports sciences getting involved. He threw all that out the window and said, give me the ball. I will win you this test match. In his second test. Seven's extreme, isn't it? A the, seven over spell for a quick is extreme. Oh, mate, in those conditions up there, it was 95% humidity <laughs> and, and it was 35 degrees. Yeah. It, it was stinking hot. You've seen the Australians have to go on and off. For, yeah. for three over spells. And to be able to do that, then sprint off when he got the last wicket, it, it was, <laughs> he, he went after him. The, he got quicker and quicker as it went on. And it was, it's a great story, not only just for West Indies, but world cricket hmm. uh, to see what he did. It got me a couple of days ago looking at um, Malcolm Marshall videos yeah. about, because he wasn't, he was yep. the smallest of those Windies quicks. Yep. And he was just fright. You talk to the guys at that era, and he go, "Well, Malcolm Marshall was just frightening because the way he could get the ball to jack up off the pitch." And what what is it about this guy? And you didn't answer the question. How would you face him at the other end? <laughs> that's, that, that's Quick the single. Way, yeah. <laughs> it's the way you face any fast ball. I tell you, he wasn't um, worried. It was Steve Smith? He, yeah. he was he was under control. But to have someone in your team that can bowl around 150 k's creates anxiety not only for the top order but more the tail. When you're sitting watching, waiting to go into bat, hmm. and you only need 60 to win, and they've got someone that can bowl 150 k's, that can hurt you. Hmm. It, it creates a lot of doubt in your, in your technique. And, and we've seen that with the, the Aussie tail. He, he went hmm. after them. He, he wasn't intimidated from the fast bowlers where, oh, if I bowl a bounce here, I'm going to get it back. He, he went at Camo. He went at Stark. Well, he knocked Hazelwood's off stump over with, with a ball at 147 k's. So, <sighs> mate, he, he just wanted to be in the contest. So... You told that great story, uh, which got over a million views on on both our social medias on uh, TikTok and and Instagram on Willow Talk. That uh, Brett Lee, that was the most frightening spell in a Shield game at the yeah. Wacker. Now, like I don't want you to compare the two, but was this along the same lines? Not even close. <laughs> Brett Lee was quicker. Not even close. <laughs> My that, God. That's why that's, that's how quick. Mate, that's how quick Brett. <laughs> well. well at times, he, he got to 147. Brett would yeah. have been bowling 160 k's. It, I'm not even. I'm not even. Okay. It wouldn't even do it justice. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But we hope to see this guy grow. And he said in the emotion after the event, "This is what I want to do. I want to play Test cricket." Now, about 40 hour, 48 hours later, he's already signed for a, a PSL team over in Pakistan to play a bit of T20 yeah. cricket. Here's the danger. So it's all well and good for these guys to have the passion to play for the West Indies, but financially. This guy is from nothing. He can furnish his entire family for the yep. rest of their lives by playing T20 cricket. Yep. And this is my eternal frustration with how cricket is set up at the moment. And I hope to God in the years to come that the BCCI and the ICC and the BCCI rightfully, because that's where the eyeballs are, that's where all the money yeah. is, come to the party and say, how can we keep these guys playing test cricket because it actually heightens their standing when they get to things like the IPL. So it's my understanding that the West Indies guys, the max that they can probably earn out of Test cricket is between 150 and 300 grand, which is peanuts compared yeah. to a Steve Smith or a Pat Cummins. So the trick for cricket is how do we keep Shamar Joseph playing Test cricket for the West Indies while being able to set up his entire family's future? Well, well, that that's a talking point now. Is he, he'll have offers all over the world. We we seen one forty eight hours later. He signed the Pakistan League. 
what we got to hope that the adrenaline he got from that test match in the series that it grows on not only him, but everyone in the West Indies. Well, you've mm. you got to look at it another way. M- maybe guys like Nicholas Purim and, and guys like that go, hang on a minute, ha- mm. how good's this test team? I, I want to be part of something special there. And that's where I think the ICC need to jump in. They need to find a way to make test cricket attractive for teams like the West Indies. Because look at the response it's got with the West Indies beating Australia. Th- this, is, this has come out of nowhere. But the support they had around the country and around the world to to win that test match, that's why we need them doing well. We need them in t- test cricket doing well. I, I hope it inspires the guys that are playing 2020 in the West Indies saying, you know what? You missed out there. Yeah, FOMO. Yeah. I, I want to be part of that. The, I think the only way it could possibly work, just thinking about it generally. Pay is, them. Well, pay them. But the ICC, use all, all that money is coming in. And there's been yep. a lot of talk about the distribution that India get. I actually don't have a problem with that because they're... They're creating the wealth coming in. Yep. So, of course, they need that portion of the pie. But there should be maybe a, a little bit shaved off the big country's distribution, keep it in a central pool and use it, and I know this sounds wild, a central pool for payments for Tier 1B. Tier 1A is Australia, India, England. Yep. Tier 1B is the rest of the test playing nations and Tier 2, which are the ones trying to emerge. And if they're playing test matches, that central pool from the ICC is used to pay these blokes properly and women as well yep. going forward as the women's game grows as well. I can't see any other way how it's going to operate because there's nothing stopping an IPL franchise going to this guy and going like Joffre Archer, apparently yep. that deal he got, oh, here's 5 million bucks over six years. You're our property. You're going to play where we say if it clashes with the Windies test match, too bad. Well, there's, there's so many ways to, to look at it. Yet, yet the one thing we want the ICC to jump in because we need test cricket strong. So we've got to find a way mm that it's attractive to play test cricket in, in places like the West Indies and Sri Lanka. It's not just about the West Indies. It's about the smaller nations. But do, do we then find a window for test cricket where, okay, these three or four months of the year, we only play test cricket? Problem is is hemispheres there. there there's problems it, everywhere. You've got summer and yeah. summer. So maybe yeah. it's two windows through yeah. the year. Yeah, there's problems everywhere. And that's why it's not, not black and white. But, yeah. but we, we need to find a way to keep these teams like the West Indies. That They, they bring excitement to the game. They're the true entertainers. And that's why people were so excited about West Indies cricket winning. Mm. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they were the entertainers of the game. And that's what everyone remembers about West Indies cricket. And we've seen a little bit of that in the last couple of weeks, the the way they played. Shamar Joseph, he was fast bowling. He was athletic. He was intimidating. That's why we want them in test cricket, Mm. because it's a real contest. Let's get to the uh, debrief about Australia, shall we, Hads? So you mentioned before, Wendy's five for 60 odd in yep. the first innings, Australia two for 112 in the run chase. So certainly close enough, if good enough. And in the end, not good enough. Uh, we've talked about Joseph. Does Australia have firstly with the bat, a problem with extreme pace? I think everyone has a um, problem with extreme pace. Um, <laughs> the Whackers did that day, <laughs> <laughs> Brett Lee. <laughs> Mate, everyone did. Um, yeah, everyone's got a problem with extreme pace. We've seen Mark Wood, um, when when he cranked it up last time out here in the Ashes, it, it made life uncomfortable for the Aussies down in Tasmania. So to have someone like that in your team cre- creates a lot of excitement, but it does make opposition's nervous and it can expose weak, weak batting lineups. So there's a number of ways we can look at this. We we can look at it. The, the West Indies were five for 64 that they found a way with Hodge and De Silva to get back in the game. Uh, Australia were um, in control in the run, run chase at two for 112. Everyone's trying to book their flights and all of a sudden they lost not, um, eight for 96. Did you actually look? No, no. Um, you let the travel agent deal yeah, with that. They, yeah. they, Triple M looked after that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everyone, everyone was looking. So yeah, but if you take it back further and take the layers off, Australia haven't ha, have got some real batting concerns. Mm. Uh, you got David Warner, who got a great hundred to start the sum. You got Travis Head, got a beauty in in Adelaide, but he did not much more. But they were the only two centuries yep. of the summer across the five tests, yeah, and, and that's and that's where the problem's been. Our, our bowlers have been outstanding um, all, all summer, but I, I think we've got some batting concerns. But not not we don't need to change personnel. Um, I, I mm. think we've got we've got Marnus in a form slump. Um, which we haven't seen for since he started his test career. It started so brightly. We, we've got a change in batting order. We've got a, a new number four who's finding his feet there. He's going to need time. Not, not. I'm not saying he's not the right person. He, he's definitely mm. the right person. But, but should uh, number four in a test lineup, like the, the very notion of saying second drop in a test team is generally your best. 
you, you say there he needs time. Um, that's like saying for someone who's playing state of origin as a number seven, oh, he needs time to, no, you don't have time. Well, you're you do, the number four. No, no, you do have time. And you see that in other sports as well. You, you talk a lot about AFL where AFL mm. goes, oh, once we get 30 or 40 games into him, all of a sudden, then we, we expect a lot more. And, and that's what's going to happen with, with Cameron Green. We've identified he, he's, he's a talent. Mm. Um, he, he's got good numbers in, in state cricket and, and now we're going to need to be patient. There, there were signs um, that he's got a bit of work to do at, at number four. Um, Steve Smith, I, I thought, started to find his his groove at, um, up the top. So is that is that locked in for you for the next twelve months, Steve Smith? Well, open? it's it's locked in for the next series, hundred percent. New it Zealand, is. yeah. He, it's um he he'll definitely open in in New Zealand. So not worry about him against a really moving ball, no, which it does over there. No, Steve Smith is going to be one of the greats of the game. He, he, well, he's. Yeah, it doesn't matter where he bats. He, he'll find a way. He's one of the best problem solvers. Um, and, and we've seen from the first innings in the second innings, he, he was probably looking back at it. Yes, there was a lot of talk about his technique, walking across the um, line, not picking up the ball. He's moving too much. But to me, it was just um, overexcitement. He was trying to, to put his presence on the game. Yeah. Once he found his rhythm, mate, Joseph was bowling 150 Ks at times. He, he was the only one that, that looked comfortable. We, we compare it a bit to watching him is when um, Wahab Riaz went after Watto in, in the World Cup semi-final and Watto's getting hit. It was great to watch from the sideline and not be part of it. <laughs> but what everyone forgets about that innings yeah. was Steve Smith at the other end, just controlling the tempo of the game. He bowled the same ball to Steve Smith. He'd tap it on his head down there for one. So mm. he, he looked in control, but we, we do have some um, batting concerns. Okay. So the, we're now delving into an yeah, our unanswered questions of the summer. So let's start with Marnus then. So a lot been made about his Windy's uh, return, yep. which was well short of what we know him to be. <laughs> his numbers have kind of not plummeted, but he's struggled. And he felt like during the, the Ashes series, he was really scratching. Yep. But he ended up getting a century. And in the end, because of the rain in Manchester, that was pivotal in yep. us hanging on to the game and, and getting something out of the game. Um, but in a wider sense with Marnus, and I'm sitting on the couch as a cricket nuffy, but don't know technique. It seems like a lot of his dismissals are fourth and fifth stump. And he thinks the ball's coming in at an area and then it slightly moves away and he gets himself into trouble. Can you take us through any technical issues that he's having at the moment and how he might be able to fix it if he is having technical issues? Yeah, if you have a look at that, there's a pattern in, in the way he's getting dismissed at the moment. It's about the ball about fourth, fifth stump, just back of a length, and he's not quite knowing where he's off stump. He's in. He's defending at balls that he, he normally should leave. So he, he's got to have a look at that, and, and he'll know that. He got out the same way um, this test match, so he, he'll go back and have a look at that. There, there's another side of it to me as well. If I'm doing... Um, any analytics on Marnus coming into bat after watching how well he's played mm. in the start of his test career, mate, he, he, he was amazing. He, he was, he was averaging up near 65. He was controlling the tempo of the game. I'm saying in the meeting, when Marnus comes to bat, make him play early, he likes to lead the ball, but also be ready for a chance. Mm. He, he's given a lot of chances throughout his test career early in his innings that have been put down. And at the moment, they're starting to take them. Mm. He's starting to take those half chances. West Indies catching was outstanding. Yeah. The, the way they caught, um, they were athletic. Um, it was good to watch. It was West Indies of old. But well, you look at the difference between the two teams that came here to tour. Yeah. One could catch and one had issues. And one won a test. So, yeah, there's there's, there's a number of things. He, he'll be concerned now. He, he's in a form slump now that he, that he'll know about. But he, he's personal. He, he'll get back. He'll have a look at the, the tape. He, he'll, he'll have to sit down and say, okay, I've got a technical issue here. Is it a mindset thing as well? Mm. It's not just technically, is it, am I starting as positive um, have I done in the past? He, he's really animated when he starts his innings, Manus. Yeah. He's, he's up and about. He's looking at the batter. He's, he's pissing you off, actually, <laughs> the, the way he moves ar around the crease. And it, has he lost that? Has he lost that sharpness at the start of his innings? So there's yeah. a number of things he look at. But the bottom line is at the moment, he's in a form slump that um, him himself, he'll find a way out of it. Well, I don't know how many form slumps you had during your career with the bat. 10 years of one. <laughs> your, wasn't your way of getting out of a form slump to just to hit, try and hit the living shit out of the ball and see what happens? Well, it, over mid wicket and it, things like that. It, it's interesting uh, to get out of a form slump. It's okay. It can be technical. You go back and, and, and you go, okay, maybe he's getting squared up or his back hips coming through and his feet are, um, mm. 
going down the wicket and his bat angle. That that's a technical side of things. Or or the other one is, is it a mindset? Mm. Is it I'm not as sharp at the start of meetings? I'm just expecting that to to happen. I've been batting well previous seasons. Okay, it'll just happen for me, and you lose that sharpness. But nine times out of ten, yeah. when you're in a bad form, something you go through all that, and you keep nicking it, and you go bugger this. I'm just going to watch the ball closer and react to what I see. <laughs> and that nine times out of 10 is what happens in a form slump. Cause do, do you cop unwarranted advice as well? You, you, you cop, a lot of people will have their advice on what's happening. He's just got to go through that yeah. and work out what it is. It, yeah. it, yes. We, we look like there's been a technical issue, but is that coming from his training habits or is that coming from, he's not sharp enough um, with his innings, not knowing where his off stump was. So mm. he's got to go through all that now. And, and come New Zealand, I, I'd imagine um, he'd, he'd have that all all done and dusted, and then we'll see a different Marnus in New Zealand. But he, he's got a bit of work to do leading into that series. Yeah, Marnus averaged 28 over the summer, 19 runs against the Windies, full stop. Green, 21. Travis had 25. That was with the century. Three golden ducks, but anyway. Um, is there too much pressure on Australia's bowling attack? So we had milestones over the summer. Like, it was great. Lyon, 500th. Stark, 350th. Cummins and Hazelwood, 250th as well, but no one else got to go. So how do you balance that with these great bowlers? And Crash Craddock made the point, how do these four get through all five against India next summer? Now it's a long way away and there's lots to happen before then, but would you have liked to have seen any kind of rotation over the summer or fair enough, they were fit, they should have played? No, I, I wouldn't have liked to see a rotation. There, there was no reason to, to rotate any of the fast bowlers. Um, they, they got extra days off in, in all the test matches that they were all injury free. Um, so there's no reason just to give someone a test match for the sake of saying, oh, Josh, can you, can you have a rest? We just want to try someone. I, I'm, I'm not for that in test cricket. There, there is an argument that yes, we need to start getting a group of bowlers ready for the next couple of years. We, we need Jai Richardson's body. Um, right. And, and that might not be right now. Mm. Cricket Australia might have to take control of his prep for the next 18 months to get him right for, for two years. We've got bowling there ready to go. Lance Morris has, has been given a taste of, of what test cricket looks like in the preparation. So Cricket Australia will start to control more of his prep and make sure he he's right to go. But Do you give him a go in New Zealand? Nope. Not, only if someone's injured. There, there's there's okay. no reason to, to not play these fast bowlers. But there is, there was a lot of pressure on the, the fast bowlers this summer. They, they were outstanding. All, all the... Three fast bowlers were, were outstanding, but it, with the way the batting was, um, they, they just didn't get time to rest. I don't, yeah. I don't think that, that they were tired and needed a break. Okay. If you look at what's happened, it's been a huge 12 months. So physically, they were all fine. Maybe mentally, they're a little bit off. Mm. Um, come the last test, thinking, oh, it's been a long campaign. I need a um, a mental um, freshen up, but it's not a physical one. Yeah, Tim Payne said that. He said he just saw some signs that the, there was a few frazzled minds out there mentally. We're going to have a bit of a breather and continue the discussion after this. So overall, Hads, are you worried about the fact that what's what this team is going to look like in 12 months' time with the age profile of it? Because we've only got Green and Marnus under the age of 30. For some reason, that is the marker, 30. Yep. Personally, I think... It should be 33 yep. because modern science has dictated. You see it across other sports that, that uh, good athletes are going on for longer because there's better recovery, better prehab, um, looking after themselves, not having 37 beers after a day's play like they did on the Triple M cricket team. So I wish it was any. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that this team is too old to be ready for what's coming in the next 24 months? No, I, I think this team is looking forward to, to India and, and England. I, I think after that, it'll be a really interesting conversation in, in 24 months uh, about who's who's around and who's not in test cricket. You, the thing about what will be happening now, there'll be a lot of planning behind the um, scenes about who the next group is to come through. But yeah, I, I'm not concerned about their age. They're, they're all mm. physically fit. The, the sports science these days push pushes the age out. I, I started my test career at 30 and, and played 66 tests. I had 18 months to two years off in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you, you'd take that any day of the week. So, no, I, I'm not concerned. We, we, we've got to start to put some pressure on state cricket. We, we need people producing big numbers. So when the likes of um, the, the three bowls there, we, we want Jai Richardson ready. We want Morrison ready. We want um, Spencer Johnson 
I'm ready to do it because we've seen what raw pace does. So there'll be conversations around that, but I'm not concerned about the age. The test ranking. So we're number one, but we've yep. been pushed by number six, Pakistan, beaten by number eight, West Indies in one. We, we level the series. Uh, so Australia are still ranked number one, fractionally ahead of India. Wait to see what happens yep. to them over the course against England. While the West Indies, they rocketed up to seventh. So we're out first, but only just. But interestingly enough, in a wider sense, we've only won eight of our last 16 tests and we've won one of our last four series. Does that matter when the trophy cabinet's full and you're retaining? Well, I think the one thing we can be happy about is the trophy cabinet is full. Mm. Um, we've had some tough, cu tough couple of series. We've, we've had India away. We've had England um, where we drew the series, retain the ashes. I, I think the boys would be disappointed with that one. Mm. I, I think they, they were peaking for, for that series to to win that series. I know we retained it there. And, and when we got to the home, some, you had Pakistan and we, we, they'll be disappointed that we drew with, um, the, the West Indies. So I, I don't think there's that much of a concern, um, leading into the New Zealand series and what we've got coming up in the next couple of summers. But yeah, they, they would like to be winning more tests. I, I think England hurt them. I, I yeah. think England that they, they were primed to, to win that. I know they retained it and that's great. And that's all you have to do. But I, I reckon we wear these groups out, the experience they have. I, I think they'll be disappointed that they didn't win that Ashes. Who, By the way, just on trophies and everything, who did the trophy presentation for the, the Windies game? Was it BJ? No, BJ. No, he didn't. stays well away from the yes. Frank Worrell. Yes. Uh, Isha did it. Isha, good. Very well done. Very oh, I bet she, she pronounced yep. it correctly. Yeah, there's a little pause. <laughs> just... Because <laughs> she would have got, a, she would have got a lot of advice. Oh my uh, goodness! Yeah. And there was a lot of talk about around the media box who was doing the presentation. So, uh, yep. Yeah, Brendan did good, banned himself. Yep. She did a good job. I think we've got to get BJ in for a Willow talk. I think for uh, for a chat about various things <laughs> as well. And I reckon that's going to come up for sure. Four day test, yes or no? Thursday to Sunday. No, oh, I know all the test matches. Uh, and, and there's call for, I know, entertainment, um, why you, you want to make things shorter. Kids have got a lot more things to do, but I, I still like the five day test match. Um, mm. we, we seen it during the, the, the ashes. Like I, I don't want England to come out and in India in the next couple of summers and, and we have four day test matches. I, I still like, um, that there's five day test matches. I, I know there's a bit of talk a, about shortening it, but I, I'm still, uh, for five day tests. Mm. You? Yeah, I want to see four day tests. But not at the current overrates. They've got to do something about overrates because you're losing. If you if you cut it to four, you can't have eighty overs in a day or eighty two overs in a day. Well, they can't get through their overs now. I so. know, I know. But do, yeah. well, well, that, that's a good point. So if you do that, do you say okay, you're only allowed to change your gloves x amount of times? Can you? Well, didn't it happen in the last like when the game was on the line the other day that uh, the umpires told Steve Smith, no, you can't change your gloves. Get no, off. he had to. But they, he, he had to change your gloves he, this time. They, they were yeah. absolutely yeah, so. saturated. No, but I think someone ran on with some water or something like that, and the umpire said, get off, type thing. That, like, for me, that's got to continue to happen. If, you, if you're a sweater, bad luck. Like, I know you might not be able to hold the bat, but that's more entertainment for us. See, bats flying everywhere and gloves flying <laughs> off. And, you know, oh, it's a real challenge. I don't know about that. Real challenge. Mate, that, those conditions up there were as extreme as I've yeah. seen. Once in the um, Bangladesh, um, I, I, I've seen the conditions very similar, but the humidity on the ground. I, I remember doing the cross uh, the, the morning of day two, going out doing the piss, and, and Mark Taylor. The pitch. The you pitch, said, yeah. 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 Mark Taylor was... <laughs> Take, I was thinking of Mark Taylor and Ang Angus was taking the piss out of Ferg and I. So yeah. they come to us to do the pitch report. Yeah. And, and Gus is sitting up in the aircon. Well, they're sitting in the aircon and yeah. him and um, Tubby are having a great time. So they decided when they went to us to do around the grounds. So mm. they were calling saying, oh, the under 15 Bs at Jamoin played really well. This team played well. It was stinking hot. So you, you can't not allow the players to, to change gloves. I'm taking drinks, Blake, uh, more regularly. So that's fair enough. I get that when it's over a certain wet. That's what I was about to say. Taking the piss. Yeah, <laughs> taking the piss. Um, but is the Gabba a potential for more day night tests? Because it looked like a pretty good vibe up there on the first two days. Yeah. Well, the crowd says that. Yeah. Um, the the wicket was, oh, I think, more conducive to. Uh, red ball. It yeah. was a hard surface. The pink ball got really soft uh, in that middle part of the, the day. Yep. The player's response was Adelaide wicket is perfect for a pink ball. 
yep. and Brisbane was um, great for uh, the, Red the Red Bull because of the hard hard surface. But when you look at the crowd and the entertainment, would you, ro- uh, would you rotate one year Adelaide next year? Because people in Adelaide, some of them actually still want the day test. Well, it was interesting that the people in Adelaide, they did a survey about that. And we, we thought the same. We, we mm. thought that they wanted the day test. But the survey... The numbers were the other way. Oh, they want the day yeah, night. They, they wanted the night test. So, and that wicket suits the night test. It keeps the ball um, a bit more shiny, allows for a bit more swing ladder in the day. But yeah, I, I thought the day night test was a success in, in Brisbane. Hads, later this week, Australian Cricket Awards. So, you've been to a few of these at Melbourne's mm-hmm. Crown Casino. Good fun, uh, especially if you're not up for an award. Right. Before we get into who might win, which we really don't care about, I want to hear some good stories of on the tiles at the Australian Cricket Awards. What's the Who are the best and worst people to sit next to at these awards at the same table? Well, the best and worst people to sit next to. The best people to sit next to are the ones who aren't going to get an award. Because <laughs> you can get trolled. Well, the cameras don't come to <laughs> yeah. you. you. You can tell at those awards who are going to get it yeah. because the cameras wait in the table. And the worst people to sit next to yeah. are if you're on a table and you think, oh, I'm not a chance for an award, but the camera's on the whole time. <laughs> so you've got to sit there and you, you pretend you've got water in front of you <laughs> and you sip on the same beer to the, the after party. So yeah, the worst people to have next to you are someone yeah. who's going to get an award. So do you, do you play bingo or anything like that about uh, at the table or is there any kind of games to keep the momentum of the night going up and make time go a bit quicker if you're sitting there a bit bored? No, it's normally a lot of alcohol flowing, <laughs> so it's you don't have to worry. It's good fun. It's, yeah. There's been some... Um, the, the best time for those awards, uh, because they're televised now, is the after party, where you've got all the ex-cricketers, everyone's relaxed after a hectic 12 months, and, and you have an absolute ball. There, there's been a yeah. talk of... Guys winning the awards and, and walking back to their room, showering and coming down and doing the, the morning <laughs> shows. So there's, um, you, you get a, a good three, two and one. The Marsh yeah. boys were always great fun to, to be with. Why do they, these guys keep on coming up in things like this? Yeah. Just like... because they're good fun. They're, they're, you have good fun with them. Ryan Harris was, was outstanding. I, I yeah. normally spent most of the night with the fast bowlers. We had, uh, Harris, Johnson, Sids. We, we yeah. normally had a good time. And it's also a great time for your wives that they have to, put up a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. with cricketers. Yeah. So they get the, the chance to get all dolled up. Um, mm. there, there's times when you see them walking home, holding the shoes in <laughs> hand. So <laughs> it's good fun, but yeah, you, you don't want to be next to someone who's up for a major award. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So for this year's cricket awards, where everyone's hoping that they're sitting at a table where no one's going to win, uh, the voting period is the <laughs> 22nd of January, 2023 to the 9th of January, 2024 for both the men's and women's teams. So women's teams after yep. the tour of India and the men's teams after the SCG test before the Windies test matches. Men's votes are weighted, tests worth one, one day as half a point, T20s a third of a point. Australian men played 43 matches in the voting period. Australian women played 32. Willow Talk re- research team has Mitch Marsh, Pat Cummins, Usman Khawaja and Steve Smith in the mix for Shane Warne, Men's Test Player of the Year. Marsh, Zampa, Hazelwood, Maxwell. The standouts for the one dayers. T20 could go to any one of Marsh, Head, Sanger, Wade, Sean Abbott. But overall, the research team on the men's side, Mitch Marsh to win the AB, AB medal. Yeah, I agree with that. What a... Uh, what a turnaround. What a comeback. He, like producer Sam has done the numbers crunch and he's got Mitch Marsh, yeah, on, on 35 points, which is uh, clearly a winner. Well, the one thing Mitch Marsh became over that time is a three format player. Yep. Uh, he did well in 2020, played well in the World Cup. And, and we've seen once he came back in the, the test team at, at Leeds, um, he, he's been outstanding since then. So, yeah, I, I reckon he's going to feature high. I think the skipper's going to be right up there um, as well. He, he's... The only thing maybe against him, he had a few series off, um, just managed his loads. So loads, favorite word, <laughs> rotation, <laughs> loads. Yeah. Adam Zampa, um, he, he did well in, in the white ball. I, I don't mm. think we'll get a, uh, a medalist that no, doesn't play tests. No. no, not with the amount of tests that we've played. No, not this, this time round, but yeah, you've got four tests against India, then the world test championship, then the ashes tour. And then the Pakistan series, that's a lot of weighted points towards the test arena. The, the other one who was on fire, he looked just sinking through the voting period before he got injured was Nathan Lyon also. Mm. 
So he missed a couple of those test matches. Well, how critical was that, actually? Um, mm. In the Ashes, he, he missed three test matches there. That's going to cost him. Yeah, but he, he did really well in India. Mm. Um, he, he's done well th- this summer. So Travis Head, um, every time Australia's been in trouble in big moments, big test series with mm. the World Test Championship, he was outstanding. When he returned to the squad for the one-day World Cup, he got 100 against New Zealand. He got that unbelievable 100 in the final. That should be six votes. That shouldn't be just three. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing about the weighted, like the the, the, the one-day is, you know, in South Africa, which are a warm-up, and we had, you know, a lot of guys sit out. They're weighted the more in one-day as is the World Cup finalists. That doesn't make sense to me. There's, What's well, a game for Australia? It's, it's never going to be. But, but it, it, there are go- games for Australia, and there are games for Australia. Yeah, true. But... In the voting period, mate, Uzi's an interesting one as well. Mm-hmm. He, he His name will definitely be, I think, around the Test Player of the Year. He, yep. he got the um, International Test Player of the Year recently at the ICC Awards. Pat, Paddy got Player of the Year. Yeah. yeah. Um, Should so, there be a golden move for best character in the last 12 months? And I think Travis Head would be a dollar ten favourite for it. Or Mitch be- Marsh, close enough. Best but, character. Yeah, just like, you know, bring a vibrancy to the team. <laughs> like the team actually votes for it. Well, what, call what it the golden Merv, and the stat and the the trophy can be Merv sticking his tongue into Alan Border's ear. Well, Aussies call himself the people's champ. Yeah, well, I, you, I, I, as soon as you call yourself that, well, you're out of the sorry. Voting. You can't give yourself no, your own nickname. Hundred yeah, percent out of the voting. Yeah, but I, I would like to see the people's champ award. The people's champ. <laughs> Who wins that? Trav, for sure. Mate, Mate the Seven Eleven Sunnies, <laughs> the carry on after the Mate, World Cup Adam, final. Adam Zampa. Yeah. He's got a good following. Well, especially with the people in northeast New South Wales with yeah. the 420 shirt. So, anyway. M- Mitch Marsh. Mm. We, we know. Yeah, well, you'd vote for him. Well, Sean Marsh might even win that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that According to you, yeah. Sean Marsh is going to win awards mate, in 10 years' time. Mate, Ryan Harris might still be <laughs> in contention for that. Other awards up for great. We've got to get Sean Marsh. I know he hates talking, but somehow we've got to, I don't know. We'll do that one at the pub, maybe after oh. th- three or four Swan Lagers. Uh, other awards up for grabs. The women's one. Oh, sorry. The, the women's side of things. Uh, so we've got the AB medal. Women's one day a player of the year is out of uh, Phoebe Litchfield. One of your faves in it. world cricket. <laughs> Elise Perry, Ash Gardner, Annabelle Sutherland. Women's T20 players out of Perry Gardner, Beth Mooney, Elisa Healy. Uh, not sure if Mooney and Healy are talking to each other after what happened in the second T20 the other day in Canberra. It's the only way you're going to get Mooney out. <laughs> oh, far out. How well, lucky was that? And we'll have, hopefully have the captain on soon to, uh, to, to review everything that's gone on and what is a pretty good series against South Africa. Um, but overall, the research team predicts Elise Perry to win her fourth Belinda Clark medal. So uh, I'm going to go another way there. Yeah, yeah. Which way? I think Mooney will win the okay the medal there. I, I think Phoebe. I think she'll definitely. Well, she'll get Rookie of the Year. She's dominated since the she's Betty coming. Wilson Female Young Cricketer of the Year. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think she'll win uh, definitely One Day Player of the Year. Yep. Um, so yeah, you got the Women's One Day Player of the Year. Yep. You got the BBL Player of the Tournament. Uh, you got the Men's Domestic Cricketer of the Year, Women's Domestic Cricketer of the Year, and Bradman Young. Young Cricketer of the Year. So you're getting Litchfield the uh, Betty Wilson Award yep. for the Young Cricketer of the Year. What about a Men's Young Cricketer of the Year? Spencer Johnson. Is, it, is he young enough? Well, yeah, he hasn't played. He hasn't been around that long. Yeah, I know. He hasn't been around that long. If not, he? Ollie Davies. Okay. Ollie. Yep. Fair enough. There you go. So, there oh, the awards. Wait. The other what? one. What? Um, Jake Fraser. Uh, uh, what? Because he mentioned Willow Talk on air. hundred <laughs> percent. I can't believe we didn't uh, give him three. He's, you know what? I'm going to write that down now. Three votes. Done. They, sh- they should have a podcast of the year award. We've got a few rivals. Have we? Willow. Yeah, we do. Oh, they're all competing for second. <laughs> <laughs> That's us for this edition of Willow Talk. Hads, catch you later in the week. We're going to have our overall summer awards. We've got our own Willow yeah, Talk awards. So that's coming up later in the week. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.